G'day, I'm Sean and welcome to the Car Expert Podcast. We're back again for another week. The Olympics is over, so the most exciting thing to watch is us. Scott and James, how you doing, guys? Welcome to the Car Expert opening ceremony. We're back. I know, we haven't got Tom Cruise, but uh, we do have James with a haircut, so that's pretty good. Yes, thank you. I've um, received lots of flack for my hair lately. Have you so received compliments I... since giving it a trim? Yes, but I guess the comments will tell online later. <laughs> well, everyone leave James a really nice comment and telling him how good his new haircut looks. <laughs> or don't, if, um, if we see lots of bad ones, it's probably just one of Scott's accounts. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but look, before we get into it today, we're going to talk about uh, Porsche Taycan, which James went and drove in Tasmania. We're going to talk about Tesla Model Y and VFAX. But we're starting off with the top stories, uh, top news stories on carexpert.com.au. And we kick it off with Isuzu. It's been a bit of a bad week for them with 100 150,000 vehicles issued a recall notice. DMAX and MUX vehicles could have a fault in the engine control module. The recall states the ECM may incorrectly reduce engine power, which could result in the engine stalling. 149,049 vehicles produced between 2020 and 2024 are affected. Owners will be contacted in writing by a Zuzu Ute or can make a booking at their local dealer to have their vehicle inspected. One of Mitsubishi Triton's great claims to fame is its one-ton payload, a sticking point for people looking to get a private novated lease. Mitsubishi are fixing this by offering its top spec GLS and GSR versions with a reduced payload for private lease buyers. Prices remain the same regardless of the payload selection with the GLS starting at $59,090 before on-road costs. And Subaru have launched a limited black edition of the ever popular Outback model with the Sport Touring XT Special Edition Yes, that is the entire name. Joining the ranks. It's an additional $500 on top of the Touring XT, but comes with a special edition geyser blue paint, blacked out badges, dark alloy wheels, and a rear spoiler. Whilst it's not packing the WRX STI engine we would all love to see, Subaru are hoping it will prove popular, with pre-orders now open for delivery in September. And I think, guys, I don't know about you, I think that new uh, Outback looks really good. That colour and the black pack, it actually looks quite good. Subaru has form with its special editions. I know that we want, what we really want is WRX STI, but historically the Outback has had a lot of good like touring or off-road packages that you can put on there to really make it look quite tough. And I just want to touch on that Mitsubishi thing. So look, I know we've we've all spoken about the Triton on this podcast before and I had various faults with driver sensors and things like that. What do you guys think about, like, it's only the top spec models that get this reduced payload. Do you think they might maybe be missing the mark, like in some of the lower models should have the option too? Uh, not necessarily, because I think with those ones, they're, they're the ones that are more likely to be bought by people privately. Um, whereas with the payload on the heavier duty stuff, which is the, the two lower grades, is part of that package. So it would almost be redundant to have a heavy duty workhorse that doesn't have a payload that the nameplate's known for. So and could you like can you explain why it's only private novated leases that need this reduction? So private novated leases, uh, if you are buying it for a, I suppose, a passenger car or a passenger type vehicle, that thousand kilo payload is the cutoff and it works the other way as well. There are certain incentives available to people who buy commercial vehicles, but a commercial vehicle by an Australian government definition has a payload of greater than one tonne or is capable of carrying more than a certain number of people. So it's sort of an arbitrary cutoff that decides whether you're buying a work commercial vehicle or a passenger car. Fair enough. All right, well, let's dive into VFAX because... Um well, we're, we're still not entirely right on a d decline in sales, but uh, there is a new uh, king, I suppose, in the VFAX charts. Ranger's out, oh boy, it's still in, it's obviously it's still uh, a popular car, but it's not number one anymore. The RAV4 has taken the top spot. Um, I mean, what, do you guys know why? Is there any sort of reasoning behind it? Demand has been really high for that RAV4 for a really long time. We've known that they've had long waiting lists. At one point, Toyota was quoting sort of 12 to 18 months, if not longer. They've finally got supply of them. And there's a lot of people who put their money down in the last couple of years that are finally getting their cars. I think as well, we've seen more broadly across the industry that people want hybrids. As a stepping stone to full electric, they make a lot of sense. And the RAV4 is the best known hybrid out there. Kind of makes sense that as stock picks up, as more start hitting the road, there are more people who are going to walk into a dealer and go, actually, I, I really like the idea of that. And the, and the wave continues. I mean, petrol numbers are down in the month. Hybrids are up 88%. Now, do you think that's more uh, just stock availability or do you think that's actually demand, James? I think it's still, uh, you know, it, it'll be based a lot on demand too. The, the more options are coming to the market now, which is something that is really only been happening in the last six to 12 months. So if, as things were supply constrained or, you know, the cars that weren't available yet, people probably hung out for them. You know, as you say, more cars are getting on the road. People talk about it. 
then they're more likely to go and buy a hybrid as their next purchase. You've got Toyota, Hyundai, bringing out more and more hybrids that are more readily available. There are other brands that are getting on it as well. We're seeing an uptick in FEVs as well. So there's just more options and that will probably bring more um, sales as well. So um, RAV4 number one with 5,933 deliveries, over a thousand more than Ranger. I mean, It was an all time record too, I think. Yeah, like yeah. that's gotta be a bit of a kick for Ford. Um, uh, Hilux third with 4,747 deliveries. Corolla fourth. Uh, where'd Corolla come from? <laughs> <laughs> That's out of it. I mean, I mean, it used to be the world's most popular first car, but like, obviously you're seeing a bit Just of a comeback. Most popular car. Well, that's, stop. that too. Yeah. Yeah. First car. <laughs> it does make sense that these are nameplates that are really strong. People have known for a really long time. The world's a bit uncertain at the moment between war in various places, prices on things rising, there's a lot of factors that conspire to make people feel unsure and the Corolla is a really good car. But there I think is also something to, when you aren't sure what's going around you, you tend to gravitate towards what you know and people know what a Corolla is. So this may not play out over the next month or so, but it doesn't surprise me that people are sticking with nameplates they know and maybe we see a bounce in those ones that make us feel all warm and fuzzy and safe inside. Mm, fair enough. I mean, look, I, I personally haven't seen the numbers, like the specific Corolla split between petrol and hybrid, but I imagine quite a big number of those are hybrid now. Well, now most of those Toyota nameplates are now hybrid only. So if people have put in their orders in the last couple of months, they're likely to be only ordering hybrids anyway. And the I think also another thing is that we're still seeing a lot of the prices now are starting to stabilize and even get sharpened. A lot of brands that had really, really good discounts or, or deals coming into the end of financial year have actually kept them into the new financial or whatever remaining stock there is. And, you know, we've seen a lot of a rise from the Chinese manufacturers of late, but now that the legacy brands are sort of dialing back on pricing and perhaps doing more deals at the point of sale, people are probably more willing to spend that extra grand or so to get the car that they really want or the nameplate that they really like, as opposed to going for a cheaper alternative that is really based on value. So I think that's something that we're seeing as well. Yeah, right. So yeah, Corolla 4, 2,688 deliveries. D-Max 5th uh, still holding up there, 2,369. But uh, the big thing was that Tesla is still reporting their numbers, which has really confused me quite a lot because... I thought they were out at the end of uh, end of June. So the Electric Vehicle Council um, is now reporting numbers for Polestar, Tesla, a couple of other brands. I don't know whether it's just a legacy holdover or whether Tesla has now that the um, fuel efficiency standard is in place and there's been some changes in government. They're now backing uh, backing VFACs and the FCAI again. I'm not sure quite how that works, but. Um, it was an interesting number. I mean, 19th on the sales chart for the Model Y is quite a long way back from where it's been. We know historically Tesla likes to load its deliveries towards the tail end of a quarter, but it'll be curious to see next month how the Model Y shapes up and obviously for September as well. Just, I suppose, to see whether we are seeing a bit of cooling in Tesla demand, whether it's supply-based or whether there's just a ship waiting offshore about to dump a whole lot more Model Ys on us. Well, yeah, they cut the guts out of the price. It's now like mid-50s to get into mm -hmm. an entry-level Model Y, which is an absolute bargain. It's a bargain, yeah. Um, and we are going to talk about uh, Model Y and its competitors a little bit later on the podcast, so stick around for that. Uh, yeah, um, Kia and Hyundai are still also in the top five. Um, interesting race uh, between those two, I think, because they've both been bringing out a stack of hybrid models lately, which is obviously helping drive their sales up. But... Uh, Hyundai is sort of the owner of Kia as well. Do you think there's someone sitting there going, we need to sell more Hyundais at the moment, or they're just happy to be fourth and fifth? This is a question that Hyundai gets asked all the time in Australia, and the answer is always the same. The answer is we aren't the same business. We're part of the same motor group, but fundamentally we are competing with each other. Yes, it's frustrating that our little brother is beating us, but there's no grand plot from the top. We just need to, with the product we have, work it out. So... I don't know if you've heard differently, but it's not like there's some lever being pulled, I don't think. I th yeah, whether we've been told one thing or another, but I think it's, it's obvious that Hyundai Australia has been given better access to things than Kia has. You know, you see, using the Tucson and the Sportage an example, the two best-selling cars from the respective brands, and Sportage has done so well with very limited access to hybrids up until recently, and even then, once Kia brought them, it was like they capped it at 300 a month, which is you know, not even a quarter of their monthly volume. Whereas Hyundai has a sprawling range of eight different variations. And at the launch of the car, they had, you know, 4,000 on the way, either here on a ship or at the port ready to go from, um, from Korea. So 
it's and you see the breadth of their electric hybrid and um, anywhere in between options and Hyundai seems to have been given better access so whether they're officially saying you know head office wants us to beat Kia because it's the same problem in Korea Kia's beating them in Korea as well the Sorento outsells the Santa Fe the Sportage outsells the Tucson so it's something that they're the two brands are probably constantly tussling over and you know from a local perspective if they can get better access and, and lean on their extensive portfolio then that's probably what they're doing and they're starting to close the gap a little bit but the end of the run to the end of the year we really interesting. Fair enough. All right. So um, let's throw it over to you guys. I guess, what are the things that really caught your eye this month? And Scott, I'll start with you. For me, it is the Hyundai i20 sales result. 72 delivered. I know that's not a lot of cars, but Hyundai only sells the i20N in Australia. Yes. <laughs> so there are 72 people buzzing around in manual little hot hatches now that weren't the month before. It's really good news. I hope we keep seeing it. Mm. The world is a better place for it, I think. It's a fun little car. Yeah, it's a it really is. fun little car. What about you, James? What caught your eye? Um, seeing the Kia Cerato return to the top 20 was interesting because that's been something that's been underperforming for them a little while. It's kind of getting on a little bit and there's an all new um, replacement coming very soon. Um, and the other thing that I noticed was that, um, you know, we, we, we get a lot of comments about uh, internal combustion engines being dead, but diesel, the one that also sort of started that whole notion as well, is up in Australia as people continue to buy more and more utes. So, you know, people say diesel is dead, but you're still buying them. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you're not wrong. It's, uh, and they don't, I mean, Ford don't have the top spot in the chart anymore, but the number hasn't really reduced per se, it's just... They the Rav just jumped fours. it on the back of that yeah. month, yeah. Um, one of the interesting things I noticed, and, and if we look, and you can read all this, uh, all these numbers that we have, they're on the Car Expert website, and we'll put a link in the show notes for it. Um, looking at the Chinese brands and their year-on-year -year change, like, they are all in the positive. They are all jumping up. And I guess, do you think that's people are starting to trust it, or do you think it's just that they're all, like, Cherry have a stack of models. Like, this time last year they had one, and now they've got a stack of different models. What do you think is actually causing that? increase. I mean, new product is a key part of it. Um, you look at GWM, they've got the Canon Alpha, the Tank 500. They've got cars that they weren't able to sell this time last year. Same with Cherry, it's got the Tigo range, which it didn't have when it launched in Australia. Um, I think as well, though, yeah, you talk price. I mean, the world is so expensive at the moment, as anyone with a mortgage or just who has to buy groceries knows. Um, if you were on the fence about buying a Chinese car, maybe that choice has been taken out of your hands now by cost pressures elsewhere. And the fact they are generally cheaper with lots of equipment becomes even more powerful. James, do you have any thoughts on it? Well, I, they, I sort of agree with all that. But what is interesting is that MG was down 23.3% last month, which sort of bucks that trend of Chinese grand, brands growing. And I know they're sort of in a period of renewing a lot of their models. But if the MG3 is used as an example, the price shot up quite a bit. And so once the old model stock dries out, it'll be interesting to see what happens with the new ZS and HS, which are likely to be more expensive than their current um, predecessors as well. And you know whether that will sort of be a shot in the foot for them moving forward in terms of their volume, because they've been banking off the success of the you know sharp pricing, you know very um, readily available as well. And now it seems that their you know Chinese compatriots are sort of beating them in, at their own game. And I, I wonder on that MG3, because it is quite a dramatic price increase. And I think they've got run out of the old one for like less than 20 grand yeah, at the moment. Until the end of the year. Yeah. But do you think maybe people were, were holding out and waiting for that car and then they've gone, mm, for the price, I'll just spend a couple extra bucks and go a Corolla hybrid instead? I don't think it's an unreasonable sort of comparison. I, I do think though, if you look at the price of the uh, new MG3, you can still get into a hybrid for about 27 grand drive away, something like that for the base model. Um, the top spec model is more expensive. Uh, for that money, you're still looking at a Yaris or a Yaris Cross. The Corolla is over $30,000. So although it might bump people towards another price bracket, I do still think if you are a budget conscious buyer, Suzuki Swift Hybrid or MG3 Hybrid, you can still get for less than a Corolla, for example. Fair enough. All right. Um, any final thoughts on VFAX before we wrap it up for this month? Well, I still think we're trending upwards. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I, actually, that is a good point because I want to give Scott a chance to change his, <laughs> to change his thoughts. Because we did say, Scott wasn't here for the last VFAX episode that we did. And we said, when he's back, we will give him the opportunity of whether he wants to correct his predictions. No, I'm standing fat at this point. Okay. Um, I mean, there's still, there's still five months left to yeah, go. There's so a lot possible. of months left to go. Yeah. Uh, and, and I do still think that all the mail we're hearing is that times are getting tougher and there's a lot of stock arriving in the country. So... It's going to be a good time to buy a car. It means discounts. It means cars readily available. But I also, uh, I also do think I still trust the people who are 
whispering in our ear saying that things are going to fall away. Mm. Well, look, if you are a budget conscious buyer... Well, I'll... have I got a deal for you? Well, actually, I have a page full of them. All you need to do is go to Google, type in Help Me Car Expert, or use the QR code on the screen. It's going to take you to the Car Expert website. We're a big company. It's like over 60 full-time employees. Very impressive. We also have a page on the site with all of the deals going in Australia this month to help you figure out which car you need to pick. We can then even put you in touch with one of our friendly dealers who might even be able to get you a better deal as well. So go to Google, type in Help Me Car Expert, or whip your phone out, scan the QR code, and away you go. All right, James, you recently went on a jaunt across the Bass Strait to the Apple Isle, and um, it wasn't just to spend some time in the cold. You actually uh, had a bit of fun while you were down there. Yes, so I got to join Porsche for the launch of the new Taycan, which looks very, very similar to the old one. And a lot of people will be like, oh, it looks similar. It looks the same. There I are think some... I actually asked you that question this yeah, morning. Yeah, <laughs> there, there are some very subtle design changes, but there've been very, very big changes under the skin to the point where Porsche actually claims it's the biggest midlife refresh they've ever done. Wow. So there's been extensive revisions to the batteries, the electric motors, the, you know, the um, electrical architecture. So it's got more energy dense batteries, it goes, it's got better range, it's faster, it's more powerful, all of those things. So all the tech's been improved there, but it is very much the same formula that has given Porsche, um, allowed Porsche to receive a lot of acclaim for it, because the Taycan is often regarded as one of the benchmark EVs for like drive experience and all that kind of thing. And um, so yeah, we got to drive it out in um, Southeast Tasmania um, on some of the winding Targa roads out there and also at Baskerville Raceway, which was a lot of fun. And we got to sample um, from the base Taycan real wheel drive all the way through to the turbo. There is still a Turbo S and a Turbo GT coming. And that Turbo GT, if the turbo is anything to go by, <laughs> is going to be so wild. Which let's, let me be really clear to the folks at home, they, that doesn't have any turbo chargers. No. Uh, it is very much like the early days when they just stuck turbo stickers on things just to say it was fast. But, I mean, the yeah. Tesla Model S Plaid doesn't have any tartan inside it either, so, that's, you know. I suppose that's true, but um, <laughs> slightly different. Uh, I am curious as well. So, you know, Porsche traditionally, a new a midlife update 911 will come along and they'll be like, oh, we changed 500 different components in this. Do you think Porsche counting all the lines of code that they changed as <laughs> different components? In the Taycan? Well, it seems like there was actually a lot of hardware changes. So, you know, the batteries, are, even though they have the same footprint, are basically new units. So they're, they're bigger in capacity, they're, they're more efficient, they've got um, better components to make better use of all the heat efficiencies and all that kind of thing. There's a heat pump in there. And so when it was all explained to us, while it sounds simple on paper, there's quite a lot that's gone into there or a new component that's unlocked this new potential from them. And you know, to the point now where it, they've upped the charging capacity to 320 kilowatts via DC charging. And if you can, uh, in here in Australia, we don't have a lot of 350 kilowatt charges, but basically you can replenish 320 Ks in 10 minutes. So well, that would be great if any of the 350 kilowatt charges ever worked. Well, in that, this is the problem, right? Because I, I guess in Europe you, you can make that claim quite boldly because you know that's something that people will be able to be able to use. But you know, in theory, that is so much closer to that five minute fuel mm. stop that we complain about so much with electric cars here. But it's still a lot of fun. It's just a, a really like it's like the new way or the new chapter of Porsche. And I guess that's probably what they're trying to drive home is that it's not necessarily meant to feel like a 911 or a Panamera to drive, but it's a really cool, fun way to enjoy electrified motoring. So the old Taycan uh, debuted a whole new interior design for Porsche. Had the touchscreen in the middle, passenger screen that's now rolling out across the range. Have they made many changes to that tech and can you finally adjust the airflow without using a screen? No, you can't adjust the airflow without using a screen. I was taught how to use it and I pretty much exclaimed to my co-driver that I still thought it was a stupid idea. <laughs> but um, no, it still has the same you know, overall architecture and interface. Yep. There have been some optimizations to the software to, you know, deeper integrate Apple CarPlay. So I think you can use Siri to adjust the temperature and things like that now. Um, there's a nifty little widget in the instrument cluster that gives you like a real time battery reader and you can use the, um, the range planner so that you can get it to tell you at the current temperatures, what your maximum charge rate would be, how long it'll take you and all that kind of stuff. And um, speaking of the battery, the optimal DC charging temperature has been reduced by 20 degrees. So- Handy in Tassie. Well, exactly <laughs> right. And you think about in Europe where these things are commonly used, they have very, very harsh winters as well. So it's like now 15 degrees instead of 35. So you can start charging at your know, maximum or DC rate much, much quicker. And also the, the charging curve, it means you can do it for much longer. So that also will contribute to like that stat that I quoted before that, you know, 315 k's a raise of 10, min 10 minutes. It means that you'll get 
faster charging for longer, which I guess is something that is really based off customer feedback. So turbo 650 kilowatts that they're gonna put out of those batteries, are they positioning the Taycan to take the 911 spot in terms of like their halo performance car? Someone in Stuttgart just I know, but like yeah. shot in the chest. Just think about like not even the new 911 hybrid or the turbo puts out that kind of power. No, but I think a 911 turbo will do a mid two, two second zero to 100 run and will also go well over 300 kilometers an hour. And it's a completely different experience as I was saying before. We did actually get to do some zero to 100 tests and held a competition to see who could get the fastest acceleration time. I didn't win, but I did get a, I think a 2.8 second run, which is 1.1 off the claim. I've actually got GoPro footage, which we can stitch into okay, this, or we can post on our socials as well, where I was not expect. I don't think I've experienced a car that fast, especially from the driver's seat, and to use the launch control on it, where it's a very much, you flick it into Sport Plus, hard on the brake, hard on the accelerator, and it just pops up with a message to say, you can go whenever you want. And the violence in that acceleration, like I thought I got punched in the throat. Okay. So launch control. Oh my God. <laughs> That's how, <laughs> how hard it was. Well, Albors did the the Turbo GT in, I can't remember, somewhere in Europe, and he did the whole to 200, which only takes that amount of time again. And it, yeah, I, I'm surprised. I think he's just recovered from it. <laughs> like, it's, it's incredible how fast it is. And like dri then driving it on track the second day after doing it on the, the Target Tazzy roads, it was it was really incredible just how much grip and how pointy it was, again, given the weight and the size of the vehicle. And we drove both the sedan and the Cross Turismo. The Cross Turismo is like another 20 mil higher. It looks like a big wagon. You know, it shouldn't be that fun or fast on track, but all of the different variants that are available, you can genuinely have some fun on a track. Now, Scott, I know you are the Porsche man in the office. Yes. How do you how do you feel about it? Because obviously you adore 911s. I do. But how does this thing make you feel? Uh, I actually, uh, I get it. I, I don't know that I would buy one. And one of the reasons is because you look at how significant this upgrade was compared to the first gen car. And I, I, I doubt the next version is going to be a step backwards either. This is moving so quickly, it, it's hard to see them holding their value particularly well. But Porsche has to move into a new age, just like every other brand. Ultimately, the, the market for big petrol cars is, is dying. And if they don't keep up, they'll be left behind. So I think the Taycan's a really interesting way of showing that you can take your brand DNA, you can interpret it for a new age, and you can still speak to the people who liked a 911, for example, and bring new customers in. With all of that said, I am, uh, I am intrigued to know what happens to the Taycan, whether it becomes a long-running name like Panamera, like Box to Have, or whether it is a one and done situation and Porsche then decides to make the Panamera go electric or brings back the 928 badge or, or something like that because it is a pioneering car, but I don't know that the name means much. And I think maybe once this car's done, it's dashes showing what Porsche can do in the electric age, it's then time for that tech to be passed on to something else. I think you raise a good point because this car does make Panamera irrelevant if they're going electric as a company. Yeah, it's a little bit smaller than a Panamera, but fundamentally the jump from Taycan to Panamera is not massive. Yeah. So if you meld those two into one, it's very easy to see how that becomes then just the Panamera EV. And as we've seen, Macan has just gone fully electric. So, it has, and yeah. Cayenne well at some point uh, as well down the track. Absolutely. All right. Um, the big question, I suppose, James, is how much does it cost? Uh, well, it depends on which one you're buying. <laughs> so, right. Ladies and gentlemen, take a seat. Uh, this is this may hurt. Yeah, so a base Taycan rear-wheel drive will set you back from well, about 175 grand. I That's, love the hell, the emphasis on from. from that you put yeah. Well, I, I say that because when you play around with the configurator, you can very easily put on 50 to 60 grand worth of options without really trying. And so, and it's pretty much the same across the range. I think the 4S was like the perfect sweet spot if you want like the really, really fast car that is also, you know, not stupid expensive because it's still a sub four second car. It's like a 3.7 to 100 sprint. It looks just like a turbo if you, you know, do it up with some nice options on the money, with using the money you saved from <laughs> We're not from the turbo. <laughs> yeah, they're really comfortable. They've all got standard air suspension. They're really quiet. They're still fun to drive. So all of the controls are really dialed in and engaging. So you can still have fun doing the mundane stuff without feeling like you're shackled on public roads like you would in a turbo or turbo S because really two seconds and all the fun's done. 
you know, you get onto a freeway, freeway on ramp. <laughs> and I know Tinder Scott bio, has, yeah, no, so Scott has similar experience in not driving a tight car. Slightly but, too slow. But, but, um, but, yeah, it's a family it's, show, yeah, folks. Yeah, yeah but it, it's, um, I think that's, that's where they do their best work. The base one is so much fun as a rear wheel drive, you know, high powered sedan. It's still sub five seconds to hundred. It's got really nice balance to it and it's not super expensive. The 4S is really, really good if you want that little bit of extra performance. I think the Turbo and the Turbo S are maybe one step too far for a lot of people and probably just, you just don't need all that pace, but they, they're all brilliant. So I can only imagine what the Turbo GT is like on track because with all the, like the two seat one with like the carbon rear that's had everything taken out, that just looks absolutely bonkers. So I guess the big thing with Taycan, it's kind of like the early HD TVs. When they came out, they were like $6,000 and now you can buy one for 700 bucks. And the tech that you see here will find its way down to lower products in the Volkswagen range, all that sort of stuff. So in the near future, I mean, if this is what we're seeing here, the future of that brand's electric product is probably pretty good, right? Well, I mean, Porsche's going all electric at some point. Uh, there is a number in my head, but I can't remember exactly what it is, and they might have even adjusted it, all electrified potentially. Yeah. Um, but the next Boxster will be electric. Uh, we know that the 911 has electrical hybrid assistance now, and the Panamera range is very heavily plug-in hybrid like the Cayenne. Um, yeah, this is this is Porsche's future. Cool. All right. Uh, well, uh, th we put a bit of an op-ed out on the to the guys in the editorial team this week. What's an op-ed? Oh, sorry. We put, uh, put out a bit of an opinion poll to the guys in the office this week uh, about what what car they would buy instead of a Model Y. Now, I'll just run through some of the options, and then we're going to find out what these guys would buy instead. Paul picked a Mustang Mackey. Uh, William Stopford, who is our news editor, picked a Hyundai Ionic 5. Uh, Jack and Max both picked mini countrymen. Countrymen, I guess, in the, is the plural of a countryman. Really they sure. are both countrymen as well. They so, are, yep. indeed, yes. Uh, Josh, <laughs> Josh picked a BYD C-Line 6, and Al Bors picked walking. But to be fair, he did own a Model Y for about five minutes, so I guess he speaks with his <laughs> yeah, He stabbled a couple of times and then returned them very promptly, so I don't know how yeah. he keeps trying. Yeah, so anyway, um, look, Model Y, they've, they've cut the price. It's yeah, mid-50s, as we said earlier. So trying to find a comparative electric car is very challenging, but what would you guys buy instead of a Tesla Model Y? I've done a lot of talking, so you can go first. Oh, thank God. Um, <laughs> sorry, speaking on behalf of the audience. Um, Hyundai Ionic 5 for me. Um, I really like the Model Y, but that really minimalistic kind of aggressively paired back thing it's got going on is kind of harsh. The Ionic 5 with the update that we know is coming will bring better tech. I think it's a good looking car and it will have a more practical interior. It's a really nice middle ground between the aggressive sort of futurism of the Model Y and the conventional family SUV. Uh, it it has that like future retro yeah. classic look going on about it with its headlights and its taillights. And I suppose one day you might go, well, I can actually have a performance version that works, which yeah. is also cool. Yeah, there's that. There's also the fact that Tesla is the real leader in efficiency. Its motors and its batteries and the way they all work, regardless of what you think of the brand, are a cut above everyone else. You get the best efficiency in the market from a Model 3 or a Model Y. Hyundai's not too far behind relative to some of its rivals, and that also counts for something. The difference is the Hyundai brakes are a lot better than the Tesla brakes. Of the Ionic 5N relative to a Model 3 performance, yes. 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 Based yes. on what we've seen from overseas. Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, if yeah. you haven't seen that video, I'll we'll throw a link in the description because it is, it's worth a watch. It's a good good yeah. video. Uh, James, what about you? I bent the rules a little bit. I didn't quite say <laughs> I would walk. sound like you at all. Yeah. Tony Crawford. Um, <laughs> yeah, I didn't say I'd walk like Elbors, but I, um, as I'm not somebody that's particularly ready to go full electric just yet, I my suggestion was a Cooper for Mentor, but the new plug-in hybrid one that's coming next year. Um, with the new battery that they're putting into it, it's gonna have over 100 Ks of EV range, which by FEV standards today is still pretty good, if not benchmark, compared to most things on the market right now. I think you've got a couple of cars in the 80 to 90 realm and they can sort of achieve it. If Volkswagen and, and, and their related brands can pull that up with all the new plug-in hybrids they're bringing out, that could go you know, two to three days for some people without a charge. So you can basically drive it like an EV most of the time. And then for people who might venture out of the city often or just likes the engagement of having an internal combustion engine in something kind of sporty, I thought that that was a really cool alternative. And I imagine it won't be too much more expensive than maybe a 
mid-spec Model Y once it comes out. And obviously, like the, the Formentor is like a really cool looking car. Mm. So it's something different in the same, you know, Teslas are sort of becoming like the new Camrys, right? You look at a, a Model Y or a Model 3 and it's sort of like what the RAV4 and the Camry have yeah. become here. Don't really notice them in traffic as much anymore. Yeah, yeah. and they're, you know, they're sort of the default choice. It's not because they're bad cars. They are very, very good cars. And, you know, but, you know, some people like us who are enthusiasts might want something a little bit different and interesting. And that's why I chose that. Mm. All right. Well, uh, what would you guys pick? Leave a comment, let us know, and we will put the link in the description so you can read the reasoning behind why Jack and Max both picked minis or why Albors wants to walk. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Picks of the week. It's time. It's like every week. Scott, what have you got this week, man? Uh, I sent this through to you on Instagram just because I thought it was funny. Um, but there is a video of two Porsche Cup cars having a big crash together, captioned with, when you tell your friend the first corner sharp. Um, reminds me of car expert go-karting challenges that we've had. Yeah, what, what happened there, Scott? Sean <laughs> opened the door and then closed it rapidly, and unfortunately we both sacrificed our races. Mm, yes. Basically, Scott uh, didn't use his brakes. And I had a terrible <laughs> line. Uh, well, so you have also beat down the door on me on the pass and shot me off track. I so had yes. nothing to do with that. I, yes. There was a cart between me and you, mate. I had nothing to do with that. Interesting. Right, let's, move, let's move on before the FIA get involved. Yeah. <laughs> James, what's your pick this week? Well, I've sort of taken your route this time and gone for Lego. So there's a oh, new like. Lego Technic set of the um, Mercedes-Benz G500, and it's got really, really cool intricate bits where things move and they pretend to be engines and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's a little Instagram reel um, promoting it, which looks really, really cool. And they've got like this little rolling road with obstacles and I think the suspension works and all that kind of stuff. I think that's really cool. Cool, yeah, there's some really cool Lego cars out at the moment. They're pushing because like, they've just got the McLaren P1 is one that you can get as well. So, uh, and if you're into Mercedes, the, I think it's a W14 uh, F1 car you can get. Okay. Um, which leads me to my pick this yes. week is F1. Uh, there is no F1 at the moment. And as we spoke about a couple of weeks ago, Oscar Piastri won his first race. What we didn't know at the time was he did it with a broken rib. So my gold star of the year and, uh, <laughs> and pick of the week has to go to Oscar Piastri for one, winning his first Grand Prix with a broken rib and two, just being totally nonchalant about it for, for Hungary and Spa and just getting on with it. Because if you ever want a three or four point or six point racing harness it, it's tight there isn't like that would be agony mm. absolute agony so uh, well done to him oscar we know you watch um <laughs> <laughs> uh, that pretty much brings us to the end this week guys have you got any final thoughts before we wrap it up yeah two thoughts the first is happy birthday to james yes, oh, oh, yes. Birthday we, should, on the weekend. we should mention that because um james is officially joining the old man group of 30 plus <laughs> yes i'm into a new decade a new era um I'm, taylor swift uh, yeah <laughs> i'm glad <laughs> i've kept some semblance of of youth about me but that could all change very quickly yeah, so it's, it's interesting because you turn 30 and your hair started falling out and yeah. same thing happened to me so yeah not long yeah but as the only member of the under 30s club on this panel i'll report back <laughs> next year um the second one is we ran a fantastic story on the weekend in three parts by a contributor of ours called gavin womersley um it's put together about whether the australian power grid can handle electric vehicles he did a lot of research, a lot of work with the Australian energy market operator with CSIRO to put this together. It's not just vague ideas. It is very well researched um, and it is well worth a read if you are interested because it's a topic that gets talked about a lot, but there's not many concrete answers on. That is a pretty uh, pretty big thing that I think a lot of people don't think about every day. So uh, description, a link for that is in the description. Yes, all three parts. Yes. Uh, James, anything from you? Um, well, apart from, I guess part of getting older is having a bit of perspective. You know, I've been, I've been in this. <laughs> <laughs> this has happened since Friday, folks. <laughs> yeah, no, no, but, um, you know, that we, we don't often, um, say how appreciative we are of the people who have supported us as a team for a really long time. There are a lot of people that comment on our website and have been in our, um, following us on YouTube and things like that since, you know, previous jobs and lives beforehand. And, you know, I've been doing this for the better part of a decade now and it's just, you know, we've, we've all achieved a lot and it means a lot that there are so many people that continue to support us. So yeah, that's my little washy <laughs> wallowy moment. Well, I think change, that, is, man. Yeah. Yeah, that is a, a lovely note to end the podcast on. So guys, thank you for joining me. I thank all of you for coming along and listening and watching this week. If you're not subscribed already, hit that subscribe button, follow along on whatever podcast platform you're listening to, and we'll be back next time. So tune in for the Car Expert podcast. See you later.